Okay, let's get started and let me first wish you a good morning, good afternoon or even good evening and thank you for taking the time to attend today's webcast. My name is David Balzik, I'm a Managing Partner and Chief Client Satisfier at Consulta and today's Achieve More webcast will be about account-based marketing in IT. This will hopefully provide you with ideas, recommendations and examples that can be applied to your markets and marketing efforts. If you have any questions or comments, please pose them to the messages board. We monitor the board and we'll respond to the questions at the end of each section. Now, let me just, just spend a minute or two on uh, giving you a bit of an overview about who we are and what we are doing. So um, I actually kind of shaped uh, this mission in a way that uh, it's going to be clear on the first look. So uh, in a way, we are a company that believe that marketing can bring results in IT we also want to prove this to the management in IT, and this is also something that we are doing more or less for the, light, the last eight years. Now, how are we doing this? Uh, we are very much engaged into development of the new business models with tech companies. We are also very much engaged in campaign executions, marketing strategy executions, also marketing strategy designs, and we believe that the performance marketing is the marketing that should be used and leveraged in tech business. Now, that's also how we shape today's presentation. We want to start with the performance marketing, especially why is it so relevant for IT. Uh, then we want to shift the gears and move towards the account-based marketing, which is kind of becoming the new trend in tech industry. Break it down in targeting an ideal customer profile. Let's say three of the most important uh, things when it comes to account-based marketing execution, how to personalize and prioritize uh, uh, things when we are executing such campaigns and at the end, you know, how and what to measure and optimize. Now, also a few words about myself. Uh, my title that I'm also using on my business cards, uh, it's Chief, Cli Chief Client Satisfier. I'm a managing partner in a company. I believe that as a managing partner, you know, I should be the one that is the most concerned about the satisfaction of our clients. Uh, besides that, I have more than 15 years of professional experience in tech business management, also sales. And since 2014, I'm full enthusiastic about performance marketing. So basically, I'm kind of entering the, the marketing or I kind of entered the marketing industry from a bit different angle. You know, I previously spent a lot of time in sales, business development, also business management. Nevertheless, I believe that this is the last big missing piece that is kind of still a bit challenging in the tech industry. And that also kind of gives me the the drive, you know, to also run our company as the agency, you know, that is doing things in a bit different way. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, performance marketing in IT. Before we even touch account-based marketing, we need to clarify a few things. And the first one is how we want to run things as a marketing organization. Now, there are different ways, you know, they're like, uh, there are many teams that are still fully engaged in brand marketing, awareness marketing. Now, and I th at the end of the day, I think this is also something that is creating a bit of a dissatisfaction on the management side of the tech organizations of the IT companies, because at the end of the day, you know, nobody is going to get profitable just from impressions, likes, you know, things like that. So performance marketing is very much about how can we make things a bit more tangible? How can we really relate or relay our marketing activities more towards the tangible business related goals. Now, before doing this, let's just kind of look on a very simple example why performance marketing is super important in tech. Now, this is just, a, let's say, an example. I mean, I titled it with Meet Peter of a person that, uh, let's say, and with his characteristics that could be interested or interesting, you know, for, for the marketeers, uh, irrespective whether they want to kind of target this person in private or business. Now, Peter is in the age group of 30 to 45 years, living in an urban area. He has a mid-management position. Job perspective, he works as a sales manager in a commercial bank, and he was recently promoted. Psychographic criteria or characteristics. So he's a thinker, risk averse ambitious, patient, and also friendly to his co-workers, but also clients, of course. Now, there's also a new category that I want to bring on this list, which is called technographic. Uh, he's digital savvy in private, so he's using a lot of apps, mobile devices, gadgets. However, 
a bit more conservative in business. He's working with a bank, you know, so banks tend to be a bit more conservative organizations. So he's a bit more cautious what he's picking or selecting when they're deciding about the tools, the systems they want to use uh, in the organization. Now, bio profile, he usually searches for information online, checks with peers, requires facts, uh, and he's very pragmatic when making a decision. Now, this is our starting point. What I would like to show you, you know, why, I mean, why there is a lot of frustration in IT tech industry when it comes to marketing. Now, let's presume that we want, as marketers, we want to target Peter as a consumer. And by the way, you know, like we are representing a company that is selling running shoes. So let's see how the overall process would actually work. Now, since Peter is, let's say, a very good profile for what we want to sell, usually, usually marketers in, let's say, e-commerce or retail, they would start by showing some ads to Peter. Now, this first ad is kind of built on the assumption that Peter is a, a bit of a visual person. So he, if he kind of sees something he likes, he's going to buy it. Now, from the perspective of the dem demographics, uh, the buyer profile fit, techno and psychographic criteria, he's a perfect fit for what we are selling. Nevertheless, Peter does not respond to this ad. Simply, you know, he just doesn't care. Now, then we try with a bit of a retargeting. We say, okay, Peter actually even clicked this ad, you know, came to the website but didn't react. No, so we want to do a bit of retargeting. So now our message is more about the lifestyle, beliefs, you know, like, okay, you want to spend more time in the nature, you want to kind of have the extra comfort with that. However, Peter also doesn't react to that. Then we have the third attempt, you know, when we actually say, okay, now it's like the, the last attempt, you know, up to 70% off and Peter actually buys. So the whole process is actually quite simple. So there are different triggers we want to expose to Peter. And at the end, you know, statistically, one of the triggers with a certain probability is going to work. Now, product in this case is clearly understood. So our campaign for the running shoes was based on the fact that Peter understands what the running shoes are for, how to use them, and at the end of the day, he's a good target for such product. Now, the second thing that is important is the right triggers. So we thought we had three different triggers, the visual one, then it was more about the beliefs, uh, and then the third one was more about the price. And I mean, I mentioned before, Peter is a very pragmatic buyer, you know, so the pricing, the pricing part kind of worked well. And then at the end, we also, I mean, what is important, how is Peter evaluating things? How is he purchasing things? You know, he basically cares about the brand's reputation, quality service, price reviews. And I mean, at the end of the day, as marketers, we were successful. The process was very straightforward, you know, and everybody's happy at the end. Now, what is kind of uh, more important for today's discussion is how Peter buys in business. Now, let's just assume that there's a company, the company's name is Chatty and they're provider of chatbots. Now, Peter with his position, with his profile, is a good fit or target for their banking solution. Now, chatbots are becoming more and more popular also with banks. And of course, Chatty would like to get him interested in chatbots. By the way, it's not just a chatbot, it's a full intelligent AI powered chatbot. Now, how would Peter buy in business? So first and foremost, if we expose a similar ad as what we did to Peter as a consumer, now there are a few things we need to take into consideration. By the way, Peter is not familiar with chatbots. He saw some in the before, you know, when he was kind of browsing different e-commerce sites, but you know, like chatbot in business in a bank, not sure. Second one, he has no clue what AI powered mean. And of course, what is actually the opportunity that would require his attention? Second, even if Peter knows what the chatbots are about, even if he understands what AI powered means, he cannot envision how could such solution benefit his team or his organization. The third one is like, even if Peter knows, I mean, he's aware there's also a business case, 
there's an evaluation stage that Peter needs to go through, like which provider, which technology uh, can actually meet requirements of his organization. And at the end, he wants to also to kind of do a short list, so like, okay, the best deal on price versus support versus user experience versus performance. Now, tell me something, how can we actually expose this, all this information, or how can we actually kind of provide all those answers to Peter with the process that I showed before? It's almost impossible. Nevertheless, this is what we are commonly doing at, as marketers when we are trying to apply the concepts of digital marketing that works in e-commerce, in B2C to B2B. So first and foremost, Peter has a lot of questions as a business buyer that also need to be answered at different stages. So like things are not super transactional here. Second one, the answers that we want to provide as chatty are a bit longer and are usually provided in stages. So we first need to make sure that Peter is aware of how could he actually benefit from the technology? What is the business case? So, and I mean, he cannot consume all this information in one hour. And third, you know, Peter is on his own. So he's not the only decision maker in a company. There's like a buying committee that has 10 members, for example, in the bank that are going to decide how to proceed with a certain technology. So things are much more complex and comprehensive here. So we cannot apply concepts of digital marketing in B2C, e-commerce, similar, I would say, uh, industries, you know, to what we are trying to do in tech when we are addressing the businesses. So campaigns are much more comprehensive. Campaigns are pretty much about telling the stories. And those stories should be about why your product matters. So B2B marketing, I'll say in the last few years, has become enormously complex with all the tools, all the techniques, tactics that are being used, you know, in order to first educate the market, second, engage with the market, and third, start converting the interest, you know, into, let's say, face-to-face -face meetings and sales. The other thing that is also important is that the tech industry as industry is evolving with a super fast speed. So that's also something that kind of brings some additional complexity. And third, which is not on the slide, I didn't want to put it on the slide. There are many people on the other side, let's say on the buyer side or potential buyer side that are still a bit kind of cautious when it comes to IT, to put it in a very nice word. So they're kind of a bit uh, scared, you know, of all the progress and the new technologies that are coming on to their desks. So awareness versus performance marketing. Awareness marketing, Coming back to my initial point about why performance marketing is something that should be used more and more in, in IT. Awareness marketing is very much about impressions. It's very much showing people that we exist, showing them, you know, more or less that we are out there and we are offering something. So what we are counting there, impressions, likes, number of visitors to our web page, favorites, retweets. So all these things, you know, that are not that tangible, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the main purpose of marketing is to serve sales with proper uh, inputs. They will not benefit a lot from that. Now, when it comes to performance marketing, performance marketing has clearly defined business metrics, which are basically measured with costs per uh, action. So in a way, the action, I mean, actions could be different. The action could be somebody attending our event. The action could be somebody I don't know, registering for our for the, for the sales consultation. But it's something that is tangible and that can actually give us a very clear insight into the return on investment of what we are doing. So it should have the performance marketing goals are related to euro or dollar numbers. So at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to performance marketing, the verdict client def defines the desired action in its qualifying criteria. So if we as uh, chatty, if we realized that 40% of the client that actually registered for our trial, they would actually convert into clients, then I would say the request towards the internal marketing team or the agency could be, look guys, our main action is going to be trial registration and we are willing to pay that much for it. Now, there marketing team or the agency figure out the design the campaign that is actually going to bring us to this goal 
So that's what we are speaking about when it comes to performance marketing. Now, just a few examples, like what could be performance marketing metrics in IT, case study downloads, webinar event attendance, trial registrations. At the end of the day, if you have a simple product, you know, some something that does not require face-to-face -face interaction, let's say strong sales involvement, you could also purchase. But these are these are these are the things you know that um, that matter. These are the things you know that we want to track. Now, keeping this in mind, we are, I would say, well set for the discussion about account-based marketing because account-based marketing was introduced with the idea of being, let's say, one of the options of doing a very uh, clear, very transparent performance marketing. Because one of the things that are um, super exciting about account-based marketing is transparency and ROI measurement. So this is something you know that, uh, I mean, you cannot do account-based marketing in a fluffy way if you're of course doing it, let's say by the book. So account-based marketing uh, is, I mean, the specifics of account-based marketing or why is it different is because we want to treat uh, individual accounts as markets in their own. So it's not just about spreading the word, the word um, more or less on a big scale, you know, and hope that some people are going to catch our message. Things are actually executed in a very targeted and personalized way. Now let's look at an example. So in the past, marketing was more about throwing the net. And when I speak about marketing from here on, I want to speak about marketing in B2B, of course. So it was about throwing a big net and at the end of the day, we kind of had high hopes, you know, that there are going to be some fish that is going to be caught in the net. So this is more or less what we are doing. Now, doing this statistically, you are somehow bound to end up with a keeper or two. And this is in a way, you know, how marketing functions. So what we were more or less observing, observing, we were observing like conversion rates, you know, we were observing different things that were happening throughout the funnel, hoping, you know, that we throw the net at the place, you know, where they're like most of the blue fish. Now, in all reality, account-based marketing has a different approach. It's an alternative philosophy that kind of uh, forces us to get rid of the net and replace it with a spear. So the main point of account-based marketing is that we want to kind of concentrate our sales and marketing resources on a clearly defined set of target accounts, not individuals. So more or less, we are targeting companies, not only individuals that have a relation or are coming from this company. And we also want to kind of concentrate our resources around personalization. So we want to make sure that the message that we are communicating resonates well with the target account so that things are not too general or generic. Now the focus, the focus is more or less, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty much about acknowledging, you know, that different people and different viewpoints com comprise each account. So for example, if we are targeting a bank, which was mentioned before, it's not only Peter as a sales manager, there's also a marketing manager. There's also chief operating officer. So there are many people that are involved in a buying decision and each of them is actually triggered with a different message. Now, of course, where does this make sense? This makes sense, you know, in cases when we are selling, let's say big or bigger deals to big or bigger organizations. Now, there are also different flavors of account-based marketing. We're going to come to that. But in a way, with all the effort that we are putting into these personalized campaigns, this will have a positive ROI. Of course, if the return, the expected return, is also bigger than selling something you know, to, um, to the company where we have potentially five seats for uh, potential five seats for our solution. So all in all, you know, that's also a visual representation of the difference between demand gen. I would say traditional demand gen and account-based marketing. So with traditional demand gen, we more or less are spreading our message through different channels, as many channels as possible to different profiles or profiles that are good fit to our message, to the age group, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in the case of account-based marketing, we are more or less focusing on the companies that are good fit, keeping in mind that those companies, of course, are comprised, you know, um, from different individuals, you know, that have to be convinced into what we are doing. 
Now, as mentioned before, um, let's say in US terms, account-based marketing, it's a proven strategy for enterprise deals, let's say Fortune 500 deals. Now in Europe, we don't use Fortune 500 that much, you know, but let's say for bigger corporate and enterprise organizations, where inbound marketing is a proven strategy for small or smaller and medium-sized businesses, let's say Fortune 500,000 deals. Now, there are of course also some differences with demand gen, uh, or inbound, we are focusing on different markets and industries. With ABM, we are focusing on accounts, which could be existing or new customers. Now, success, when it comes to demand gen, it's quantity of leads. In ABM, it's very much about quality of target accounts. Engagement with demand gen, I mean, when we are running campaigns, broad campaigns, scalable campaigns, it could be days and weeks. In ABM, it takes a bit longer. It could be months or even years. Because in very simple terms, for those of you who have a sales background, ABM, it's kind of a blend of sales and marketing. ABM is something that in its approach follows clearly the sales process or the buying, uh, the buyer journey. So at the end of the day, if we are engaged you know, with clients, when we are selling something bigger for six months, then we cannot expect that the ABM campaign that is going, I mean, well, we'll try to kind of replicate the approach that is going to last for two weeks. Objective, demand gen is usually net new clients. You know, we want to kind of generate new leads. With ABM, it's more land and expand. So yes, we also want to acquire new clients, but then it's also, I mean, the big emphasis of ABM is on relationship development. What is kind of the, the underlying research tool or mechanism for the demand gen? It's more buyer persona. For ABM, it's ideal customer profile that is more or less a bit broader, broader perspective on the company and how we want to do targeting. Now, the other perspective uh, with demand gen, you know, we usually start by like saying, or I mean, by, by the point, you know, of what do we say? What is our offer about? Then we try to find the right channel to communicate this offer. And then of, of course, also the segments where we're going to communicate this offer. With ABM, it's very much, it starts, you know, with who? So who are we trying to reach? What would be the best channel to reach this person, you know? And of course, at the end of the day, sorry, what should be the right message to address this person? And then at the end, what should be the right channel to use? So this is kind of the main difference. Now, if we take a look on the perspective, because I'm not saying that inbound marketing is dead or that demand gen doesn't work. We're speaking here about efficiencies, what is more appropriate for the different segments of the market. Both can actually be used hand in hand. So for example, demand gen can actually, or inbound can feed into the ABM funnel. So for example, with ABM, we are focusing on accounts. However, it could happen that in this bank that I was mentioning before, only we have the contact or contact details only from Peter. And we know that the buying committee is comprised by, I don't know, five or 10 people. So how to identify or how to kind of acquire the rest. So this is where demand gen, you know, can actually play its role. So for example, there's somebody from marketing from this bank that actually reacted to the inbound campaign that we are running. So let's, I mean, this is actually going to feed the ABM funnel so it's okay now we have another representative of this account which also allows us to kind of have stronger engagement and we at the end of the day we have better coverage within this account now so that's more or less about the enrichment you know like so once we kind of uh, start uh, i would say through the inbound through the upper part when we kind of start kind of uh, pulling or we start generating the leads, you know, we can actually enrich the whole ABM experience, you know, and at the end, you know, build a better engagement. So it's not, there is of course a bit of an overlap with what we are doing with inbound, what we are doing with ABM, but they can work well hand in hand. And this is also what I would say, most of the successful marketing organizations in different tech companies are doing. They have more or less two engines that are kind of, uh, working hand in hand, also depending, of course, on the market segment that they're targeting. Now, this also brings me to my second point, which is about targeting an ICP. So for the last 20 or even more years, we were actually speaking about the buyer persona and the importance of having a good insight into 
the buyer persona, enrich buyer persona, change characteristics of buyer persona based on how we're also changing our business. Now, when speaking about ABM, it's about ideal customer profile. So it's somehow like a buyer persona, but the buyer persona on the company level. That would be the simplest representation. Now, when we are trying um, to kind of identify targets, we need to look into our best customers. So when we are actually trying to, I mean, that's kind of the starting point of the ICP. So when we are trying to build ICP, we first need to look um, into targets, you know, that, that, that look like our best customers. So for example, key verticals. So do we have, I mean, based on what, I mean, based on what we are selling, you know, is there a success that is much more significant in a specific industry, or we actually have a focus with our solution on a specific industry. Now, if we are just starting with something new, it's very hard to kind of judge about that. Then we need to look into what are competitors targeting. Historical data, uh, where have you had sales success? What was the win rate? What was the deal size? Formographic characteristics or criteria, sizes of the company, uh, that we or the companies that we want to target revenue employee size geography technographics this is especially important for the tech industry i mean i think it's a must for tech industry more or less it's about technology usage usage and adoption pattern let me just give you an example so okay you have i don't know a cloud based crm erp whatever system and at the end of the day you know this will i mean it will be hard to sell this to a company that is still a bit resistant when it comes to cloud. So if we know that there's a prospect that is actually already using, I don't know, Office 365 from Microsoft, something that is cloud-based uh, from, I mean, Oracle infrastructure, whatever. So a technology from different vendors and it's cloud-based, that is going to simplify the sales process because we don't need to go through all these clarifications of about security privacy somebody else already went through that you know and kind of closed the case and then also other signals like intent data hiring patterns compelling events company planning expansion you know all of this should be added into our ideal customer profile now there are also some don'ts or don't do's <laughs> So don't focus only on bodies, companies where you have friendly relationships, because that's also a common challenge of tech industry over the years, good relationships are being developed, you know, and then we kind of narrow down the, um, the addressable market, you know, to clients that like us and we like them, you know, and try to harvest as much as possible there. But this also has a certain limit. Uh, don't focus only on existing customers. Um, so due to poor sales success with others in the past. Now, again, you know, we want to, if there are some, and for sure are some good things that we are doing in terms of sales and marketing, it could be that people changed on the other side. It could be that uh, they changed the focus. So all these customers or potential customers that were addressed in the past, uh, with lack of success could be considered also. And don't make assumption um, based on poor data collection or availability. Now, there is a bit of a challenge in uh, European Union when it comes to GDPR, also some in some other countries that kind of have uh, similar privacy uh, acts. Nevertheless, there is still uh, a lot of data that can be actually um, gathered, you know, that will actually, I mean, that at the end of the day should allow us to do a bit better profiling than just saying, look, I don't know, you know, and that's why we don't touch. Now, best fit companies, once you kind of identify your ICP, which is pretty much about what I was mentioning before, it's also important about figuring out the total available market. So how many accounts are in your database that fit that profile? So the profile, the, the profile that was mentioned before, um, can we actually expand this to other geographies to kind of leverage the engine, to leverage the ABM in a bit broader scope? Uh, what is the white space? So companies that are around us, but I said before, due to poor success in the past, we are just kind of neglecting them. Also prioritize accounts 
predictive scoring, um, account scoring is in any way something that is a must when you do account-based marketing, because at the end, of, not only account-based marketing, but when you do performance marketing, because if you cannot score the quality of the lead, then you cannot measure the success of your campaign. Sales input, super important thing I mentioned before, uh, account-based marketing is uh, to some extent across or should be across company initiative, but it requires a very strong involvement of sales. It cannot be done without sales, realistically. I mean, in our experience or with our experience, um, success is much, 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 much higher if we kind of also pull in our colleagues or representatives from the sales department. And of course, historical data. So once you kind of build this initial list that is based on your ICP, once you go through all territory, uh, through territories, so white space, you know, kind of narrow it down to what is, I would say, at the end of the day, uh, uh, you kind of short shortlist it, you know, based on those criteria. Then the last, the last part should be also about historical data, sales input, because somebody from sales, when they look on uh, into, I mean, when they look into the account list, they'll very quickly say, okay, with this account and the situation there, we cannot sell anything for a year. Now. If this is the case, you know, then of course it's good to kind of focus on others, you know, where probability of success is much higher. And that's the idea. So prioritization is uh, a starting point, you know, when it comes to targeting and uh, defining, you know, where we actually want to execute such campaigns. Now, the right people at the right accounts, once we kind of narrow down the list of accounts we want to target, the second thing we want to do is more or less making sure that we have or that we know or we can identify the right individuals, decision makers within those accounts. That's a simple snapshot from the tool, um, just to kind of give you a sense about how this looks like, you know, but at the end of the day, you want to build a list of profiles, buyer profile, basically buyer person, not buyer personas, but contacts that are associated to buyer personas within the account, the target buyer personas, you know, and of course then start an engagement with them. So a summary, when selecting the target accounts, may I mean, keep in mind that one side does not fit all. So multiple methodologies can be used to select your target accounts. It's very much uh, about the product fit. It's very much about, uh, uh, as mentioned, ideal customer profile. It's very much about the territories you can address, maybe the language barriers. But at the end of the day, I mean, it should be selected in a way that it makes sense for your company. So data points, data points that are the most relevant to your business. What does that mean? That means that if you know that uh, companies, I mean, let's say that you're selling a CRM, that companies that have uh, uh, a structure with sales manager being part of the board, that with such companies, you have much higher success than if sales manager is part of the, I don't know, um, sales and marketing organizations or, or something like this. That means you know that, of course, this is a data input that should be applied when you're doing the profiling. So making sure that you're focusing on those, you know, where historically you had better success. Predictive scoring, um, basically, I mean, based on the, the relevance of different pieces of information, start attaching score to that. So you can actually make also some assumptions about whether you're going to be successful with such account or not and prioritize. I mean, with account-based marketing, when you're focusing on individual accounts you cannot i mean it's very hard to run things like to run 30 campa campaigns in parallel so you need to prioritize a bit um, and of course at the end of the day utilize your sales and marketing efforts wisely now how to personalize and prioritize 75 uh, percent of executives will read unsolicited marketing materials that contain ideas that might be relevant to their business so what do business executives expect from us if we want them to kind of click the open button, if we want them to kind of, if we want to kind of gain their attention. So industry knowledge, so you need to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of my industry. Business understanding, you need to understand knowledge. You need to de demonstrate knowledge and understanding of my unique business issues. And at the end of the day, fresh ideas. So ideas that could actually advance my business. So how are they willing to consume this information? This is what you have on the right. So when it comes to strategic clients, let's say the biggest clients that we have, the clients that are bringing most of the money, 
one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, innovation days, executive engagements, custom thought leadership. You see there are no emails here, for example. There are no fancy digital marketing channels. And that's the point of ABM. ABM, it's not just about digital. As I said before, it's a blend of sales and marketing. And of course, all these people that we are targeting, they are going to consume information from different sources, from the meetings they have with our sales representatives, events they might be attending, uh, things, you know, they'll, I mean, they'll come, they'll come uh, across, you know, when they are searching for some information on online. So it's about kind of more or less connecting the dots. Of course, when we go more into programmatic ABM, there's of course also email marketing, account advertising, direct email, and one-on-one -on -one meetings. So the segment kind of defines the tactics. Now this is, here things are explained in even more details. So we could actually build an ABM pyramid based on the segment, the market or the target segment, you know, that we want to address with our ABM activities. So let's say for the top accounts, we would call it one to one ABM. These are like top enterprise accounts where we are willing to invest more because of course also the return or the reward is going to be much higher at the end. So in this case, it's highly customized, personalized outreaches for each account. There is going to be a lot of face-to-face -face interactions that have to be also taken into consideration, but also they have th those have to be tracked in the overall, I mean, from the perspective of ABM campaign. So marketing and sales should play their role in full alignment here. Now, there are also some data from ITSMA. So, uh, what is the me median investment per account? So per account, so per a campaign that we would run with such an account, thirty-six to fifty thousand dollars. Now, there are not. Let's say if in the from the perspective of the of the EMEA markets, there are not uh, that many accounts. I mean, there are not. There are, but not that many that would justify such investment. So this is just. I mean, here things are really done on a one-on-one -on -one basis over a longer period of time. And then of course you have one to few where we are more or less, uh, I mean, the investment here, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, from the perspective of focus, we are focusing on new and existing key accounts that have similar issues or business imperatives. For example, we could say, look, this is something we are going to run in a one to few mode if we are in a market and they're like in the market, they're like six banks and we have a solution that is that could be applied in a similar or almost the same way to each of those six banks. So with a bit of a customization, you know, we can actually serve them, you know, with our solution or there's a compelling event in the market and everybody needs to kind of implement something. In this case, you know, this basically means customized uh, with some personalization. So yes, we are going to craft, let's say our marketing materials in a way that we're changing few lines or paragraphs we can actually make it super personalized, you know, to each target account here. Now, even here, like the investment 55K or 2,750 per account, because here we can actually run things in a one to few mode. So even with the tools that kind of allow personalization, you know, customization, we can run this as a proper campaign. And then of course, going down, you know, like the things are becoming less customized, less personalized, you know, and more lead than account focused. So this is, I mean, I don't want to overcomplicate things uh, on this session today, but just to kind of give you a sense about uh, how this works. And this is a, a different representation. So once we go through, I mean, I, may, I was mentioning prioritization before, we could actually prioritize things in a way to say, okay, we have tier one, tier two, tier three accounts. And each of those clusters is going to receive a different treatment based on the return we can expect, of course. Tier one, highly personalized, workshops, ads, data that is going to be provided, a lot of, I mean, a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, interactions, where tier three, it's pretty much standard, uh, no workshops, uh, quarterly data provisions, amazing quarterly data, we're going to provide valuable data, gated content on a quarterly basis. So this is how we could actually break break down things, you know, because as I mentioned before, there is no one fit, uh, one size fit, fits all. <clears throat> And at the end of the day, this is, I mean, we want to associate 
uh, our marketing activities to the ROI. So with companies that are bringing less to us, we cannot spend the same amount of money with a marketing campaign as with the companies that are bringing more, simple as that. And at the end of the day, there is no need to focus on all accounts at once. So that's kind of just a simple like calendar of activities. Let's say we have uh, uh, things that are kind of uh, based on the cluster splitting quarters. So in uh, January, we are going to do something for one industry or one set of clients. Uh, in February, we are going to focus on clients that are using competitive technologies. So we kind of uh, rotate things a bit. So that's also something, I mean, we don't want to, I mean, because even people have a certain capacity of how many messages they can actually catch at the same time. So it's about rotation. It's about doing things in steps. And of course, the last one, um, ABM, it's about multi-channel engagement. I was, I was already emphasizing this one. It's not just about marketing and marketing outreaches. It's also about what sales is doing in parallel or what sales should be doing in, uh, hand in hand with marketing. So all these insights, uh, triggers are actually coming from different sources. It could be marketing automation, in-person interactions, what sales is putting in CRM calls, emails, website visits. So at the end of the day, it's super important that we track all the audit. We also have tools, technology that can actually track all those things because this at the end of the day is going to reflect in the scoring, in the level of engagement. And this is my, 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 my next part is how to measure and optimize. Now with, with uh, account-based marketing, uh, and I really like this, this quotation on the right, it's not about counting the people we reach. It's more about reaching the people that count. Uh, it could be applied, you know, to accounts, to people, you know, but that's where we should be aiming to. So ABM metrics are definitely different. It's less about quantity and much more about the quality because there is no, I mean, and I presume, I mean, I checked the list of people for today's webinars, so that most of them are marketers. And I mean, I, we were in the same situation in many cases, when you do a great campaign, you actually have a very good response, you know, like there are many people that are responding to that. Now, some of them actually with their private email accounts, you know, and for their private, which kind of makes them a bit, I mean, makes it a bit harder to kind of um, relate, you know, their interest with, with what they're doing in the company. But at the end of the day, you kind of realize that even with a lot of uh, with a lot of responses that you got or you received, there's a big chunk of I don't want to say it, uh, uh, but I'm saying it's a big chunk of trash. So there are people you know that kind of just downloaded something because they're doing uh, a PhD. They just downloaded something because that's uh, related to their private interest. You know, so trash in terms of what can be the business benefit. So that's that's uh, that's something you know. So at the end, when it comes to quantity, we have a huge quantity, but the quality is very low. Which again, from the ROI perspective, the quantity does not help a lot. And of course, time um, in ABM can actually take a long time to show results. However, the reward is bigger. Second thing, before touching the metrics, it's about alignment. I mean, if we don't have alignment of sales and marketing, then it's going to be a hard one because as I said, there are some signals and interactions that are being managed by sales, some by marketing. If we don't have a full picture, it's very hard again to score things. And if we cannot score things, we cannot measure the ROI. So AB metrics, uh, company-wide initiative. So we need to establish a goal and KPI for each team. There should be collaboration, there should be alignment with sales, but on the on the right, you actually have, I'm just going to touch the bottom part because we already touched the upper part. So in, in terms of, of demand generation, it's about marketing sourced pipeline in terms of account-based marketing is everyone sourced pipeline, because again, it's a cross marketing and sales initiative. For demand generation, it's new business. For account-based marketing, new pipeline, accelerating the pipeline. It's also important, you know, like, um, and of course, also expansion. So we landed something with the client. Now it's already a client, you know, how to expand from there. Now, in terms of 
clear tangible metrics this is the case so early stage metrics is coverage what is coverage coverage is basically explaining how many individuals uh, associated with a specific account do we have in our database or we kind of identified with our campaigns so it's about like say with peter's bank that was mentioned before if you have only peter the coverage is pretty bad if we have peter and four other co-workers and their preferences the coverage is actually good so that's coverage awareness it's clear you know like i mean what is the level of awareness about i mean their awareness about us engagement similar to what we were using before so how are these people engaging with what we are providing to them so pieces of content responding to the meetings etc cetera, etc cetera. now later stage metrics are marketing qualified accounts and marketing qualified leads so marketing qualified accounts are basically accounts where representatives or contacts that were valuable contacts that were or personas that were identified for this account are actually doing things in a way that they're boosting the qualification score now it could be that there is one person that is super active but the remaining four are quiet you know that will kind of drive the score more towards the bottom if we have four people that are engaging you know with the campaign but not super actively that will drive the core the score up so it's not just about interaction that happened with someone from the company but also what is the richness of uh richness what is the number of people that actually interacted with with us as a company opportunities pipeline and impact and roi these are like i mean i don't want to kind of for the um in the interest of time to kind of go through this one but coverage is new engagement um, happens on a different level and it's kind of much broader um MQAs, so marketing qualified accounts, a new metric, you know, that has to be considered when doing ABM. Now, this is also how this looks like from the tool perspective. So you have, I mean, if you just go through the columns, number of accounts, no engagement, let's say the first, the tier one, you have 15, no engagement is zero. So more or less representatives of all those accounts are somehow engaging with, with the campaign. Awareness for a marketing qualified accounts eight and open opportunity three so open opportunity means that the score associated to the account is high enough of course to kind of put this account under the opportunity column and of course this uh, this account requires a sales follow-up you know a direct sales follow-up and further engagement so uh, three core questions for abm analytics engagement so that's kind of what is pushing the accounts forward through the funnel. That is also kind of pushing our score. So marketing qualified account score up. Desired outcomes, uh, how are accounts moving through buying journeys to desired outcomes? So basically pipeline revenue velocity and the ROI. Now, ABM makes it actually much easier to measure ABM. Uh, sorry, to, to measure ROI. Because at the end of the day, you know, like when we start monitoring things in a way, as I mentioned, now we are basically have a very clear connection between the account, the money that was invested in this account and the outcome at the end. So that's also one of the reasons, you know, why more and more marketers are turning into this direction in B2B. Now, of course, we need to make sure that when we are analyzing things, you know, that we are all looking at the same aggregated picture because it won't work you know if you have a team that is looking only on early stage conversions and then team that is actually looking from the potentially sales side you know to um, direct responses from the client you need to consolidate and of course there you have a lot of tools for that this into one picture so to finish uh i mean my, my i would say conclusion for today um what is the recipe for a successful abm First and foremost, set clear goals. Why ABM for your business? Now, let me just put it in a really simple words. If you are selling something to small businesses where potential for, and of course, and the, the service or the product itself, it's not very expensive. And there are potentially five seats you can actually fill with your, with your product. Then 
don't I mean don't care about this presentation today. Now inbound, I would say traditional digital marketing is probably better engine to serve this segment. If you are more into corporate enterprise market, you are actually selling solutions that are comprehensive, hard to understand. The deals are usually bigger. So at the end of the day, also more re rewarding, then yes, ABM should be considered as the, um, as the marketing engine in the future. Make sure you identify ideal customer profile because this is the mother of all success or failure. If you don't have full clarity on whom are you targeting, what are the preferences of those companies? How do they function? You will not have, I mean, then all from here on will kind of be part of the failure. Prioritize target accounts. Don't say, yeah, you know what? But I mean, that also happened to us recently. We kind of we approached the company and they said, you know, we have this list of 500 uh, target accounts in, in, in our market and we would like to do ABM with them. It's OK, can you actually narrow down this to 30 that are more or less of a highest priority or a better fit for you? They said, no, no, no. I mean, everyone could be a good customer. So. That, I mean, it doesn't work, of course. Also, this could work, but it's probably a, a several hundred thousand dollars operation uh, to kind of properly address all those 500. So prioritize, try to find like the best fit, you know, like those, let's say five or 10 that deserve, based on their characteristics, that deserve such treatment. Profile accounts, make sure that you also enrich with which account with the context, the roles, the people that are key decision makers. Here you can actually base things, you know, on, on 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 what you were doing. I mean, how you were historically selling to them. If you have, of course, such data, who were the key decision makers? Who were the people in the buying committee? At the end of the day, you know, there are also some tests that can be done if you don't have such data. Understand buying centers and key personas. Develop the relevant messaging and content. Once you have your ideal customer profile, once you prioritize things, once you profile accounts, of course, this is the part where the engagement starts. Now, if you did your job well before that, then crafting the messaging and content will not be that difficult. If you did a poor job, then you'll be crafting the content that is not going to resonate well. So all this investment is not going to be, is not going to provide a lot of return. And at the end, orchestrate campaigns, measure and analyze. I mean, this is kind of quite standard, you know, irrespective whether we are speaking about traditional, traditional digital performance, non performance marketing, you know, we need to measure things, we need to analyze things, you know, we need to see what works well. For example, let me just give you a simple example. Uh, one of the terms that is also used in ABM is content retargeting. So, for example, when you would uh, reach out, let's say you use one of the tools, could be LinkedIn Sales Navigator, something, something like this, you would reach out to 30 prospects. And you see that two out of 30, they responded to your message. The remaining 28 are quiet. So why did this happen? Though, I mean, are they just not interested in our solution? They already have something in that is kind of similar to what we are offering. Or is it just that our message did not include a trigger before us? I, I mean, the purpose of this Peter consumer exercise before was like, People are different. Some are a bit more visual, some are a bit more emotional, some are a bit more uh, pragmatic, you know, some are more exciting about new things, you know, they want to try and test it. So that's also the purpose of content retargeting. So if there are like 28 people that didn't respond in our campaign, now let's craft the content with different triggers, with different taglines, you know. So something, you know, that so if the first one was more about the let's say innovation, you know, and uh, being more, I mean, it's like being 15% uh, faster than the rest. The second one could be about more, let's say pragmatic things such as, you know, like we, uh, the TCO, what we are offering is that much lower. I mean, just think out loud. But the point is, you know, that it's, that's associated, you know, to measure and analyze. It's also about like, okay, we see how our first reach out how this landed, you know, and then we would change th change things, you know, and um, start with the second one. So this is more or less uh, what I wanted to share with you today. It's kind of a starting point for ABM. 
also the reasons why ABM should be considered. Again, the big umbrella under the uh, big umbrella above the, the the ABM is actually performance marketing. So how to make things a bit more measurable, tangible, ROI associated. Um, I also hope you know that uh, this actually provided you with some valuable insights, uh, ideas, you know, some things that were new to you. We also kind of plan to kind of keep running, you know, those those webinars on the ABM topic, you know, and just break it in um, segments, you know, let's say uh, sub segments, you know, provide even more details, like one super nice uh, idea that that I'm kind of. I already have in my head is about like how to kind of get a better alignment between sales and marketing, how to initiate this, which is, I mean, the foundation for ABM. So um, hope you like it. Hope you also kind of continue uh, watching, you know, and joining our webinars. Um, if you have an immediate question or interest, feel free to reach out. Um, let's discuss what could be the first steps for your organization. The first call, this is how you should position the first call is for free, then we start charging. Uh, download our white paper, Does Marketing in IT Matter? So this is also something that we that we prepared uh, before this webinar, something that will give you the insight, what are the main challenges and how to address the challenges of marketing in IT. Attend our upcoming webcast. You also have my email address. Feel free to shoot me an email and to respond to this as soon as possible. Let's have a discussion. Uh, let's see how we can also support you with our services. Now. My final thought is start small. Um, ABM is, let's say, uh, cross-organizational initiative, but um, let's say uh, from our experience, you know, what we kind of experienced so far, you know, working with our clients, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's much better if we take it with a step-by-step -step approach because it's also, I mean, it also includes a bit of a change management in how different teams teams function you know so you don't want to kind of put too much on your shoulders at the same time thank you very much for your attention looking forward uh, to meet you at uh, one of our next webinars and uh, um, keep in touch goodbye